could we any um members of office and physical attendance that with an electronic device muted to avoid any feedback i'll include myself in that one if any remote participants could uh, keep the camera and microphone off unless they wish to speak and yeah, ideally not use the camera facility at all um the meeting may be recorded and data collected during the recording of the meeting will be retained in accordance with the Dick Council's data retention policy and the recording of the meeting may be added to the Council's website. <coughs> you members? I remember I was accessing the meeting, so I'll skip that bit. Welcome to the uh, Planning Transportation Policy Working Group. Um, the included members of the public. The following staff are in attendance. Um, Joanne Johnson, Head of Regeneration and Economic Development and Property. Um, Natalie Earle, Joint Inter Interim Planning Policy Manager, attending remotely. Philip Davies from Democratic Services. And we're expecting Jamil Kishore, but she isn't here as yet. So we may uh, amend the order of the agenda. <coughs> The emergency evacuation procedure, um, I think is known to all people here. If is there anyone in any need of evacuation, should a fire alarm the uh, usual evacuation procedures ap ap apply? Don't use the lifts. <laughs> right, uh, apologies for absence. Are there any apologies for absence or substitutes? Thank you, Chair. Apologies have been received from Councillor Richard Palmer, who is substituted by Councillor Derek Carnell, and also from Councillor Elliot Jays. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we move on to minutes. Um, the minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of September. Um, are members happy that this is a correct record of the meeting? Are there any declarations of interest? Good. Right. These reports are part A reports for recommendation to the Policy and Resources Committee, uh, though the scheme of delegation, I think, will also be going to the Constitution Working Group, as it is part of the Constitution and therefore has to go through them as, as well. So um, we're on to item five. Jamil, let's give her a chance to get a breath back. The um, Marine Town Conservation Area Review. Uh, we could change the order of the, the meeting. If we'll take the. Uh... Yeah, we, we, we'll do that. Um, so we will skip on to item seven, which is the uh, scheme of delegation and committee procedure ru rules uh, for the moment um, and um, the proposed changes. And I'll hand over to Joanne to introduce the report. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for your kindness in giving Jimin a chance to get her breath back. I think she's been running very fast from her. <laughs> Um, so this is a return report in many ways. The report sets out the rationale for proposed changes to the scheme of delegation and the committee procedure rules in relation to planning committee. And it seeks the working group's recommendation that these are considered by the constitution working group. So you will recall an initial set of proposed changes was presented to and discussed by PTP back in its September meeting. Members requested a specific change in relation to extension requests for consultation periods and gave us gave officers some some wider comments to be reflected upon. A revised set of proposals to be brought back to the working group at the next opportunity in November. So this is what we're doing today. The report sets out a reminder that the overarching rationale of these amendments is to ensure that appropriate planning applications are referred to planning committee for reasons of public interest to promote transparency and accountability, and to make sure that we're using committee time in, in, the, in the best way. It is a very colourful report. It's probably the most colourful report I've ever done. So Appendix 1 
nice and plain. It shows the current wording of the council's adopted constitution um, for the specific areas where we are proposing amendments. So that is the constitution as it stands. Appendix two shows the proposed changes that were taken to PTP back in September. So there were, as I say, a range of amendments in September that members agreed, and these, those are shown in grey highlights in Appendix 3. I've then included a table, so there were, there were a number of areas where views were mixed, and the table sets out where officers have, have, have landed in response to those comments. So I will run through those just because this, this is at risk of becoming quite complicated in terms of the, the, the chain of changes. So the first line in that table is around whether the head of planning should write to town and parish councils to notify them if they do not consider that their representations are based on valid considerations. Um, there was a suggestion that that perhaps wasn't the most effective use of office, officer time in writing that letter. Um, we believe that should be retained. We've in, uh, retained that in Appendix 3, which shows the version that we're proposing for consideration today. Um, and we think that supports borough parish relations. We think that's a worthwhile investment in time. Um, and it also supports parish engagement in, in planning um, and in, in upskilling the parishes. Um, the, the, the three letters provision, um, that's proposed for removal back in the September meeting. There was a discussion about that, the possible retention. We propose that that deletion is retained. So we remove the, the three letters provision. The rationale for that is, is of itself the number of representations received has no bearing on planning decisions. Um, it's, the, it's the thrust of the representations rather than the number, it's the content. Um, and we believe that removing that supports the role of ward council, uh, ward members who retain the ability to call in applications to committee, irrespective of the number of representations received. There was discussion around the value of recorded votes, um, whether the time that it takes to record votes was worthwhile. Um, we do propose that is retained. We believe the value in transparency and accountability outweighs that additional time. There was conversation around the suggestion that we ask members to declare at the start of planning committee if they have been lobbied. Um, we retained that. We do believe in line with member comments that a definition should be included in a forthcoming member developer protocol to set out what lobbying is. Um, and we will need to include um, clarity that just because a member has been lobbied does not mean they are predetermined um, in any way, shape or form. There was a recommendation around if members voted at planning committee contrary to an officer recommendation that they should write to the head of planning um, to say why they had taken that contrary view. On balance, we now propose that is deleted. Um, we think the value that we perceive that this could bring to an appeal is outweighed potentially by the administration burden and the risks that this could bring. Uh, there was a request around clarity around behaviour expectation of attendees in the public gallery. We haven't included that very much because there's a separate part of the constitution that gives the chair the ability for any meeting to remove um, to order the removal of people from the public gallery if they disrupt the meeting. So that isn't necessary to cover that for planning. And then there was a comment around um, the removal of the, um, the indication at the start of, of the meeting when the chair welcomes um, members about the quasi judicial role of planning. Um, that was picked up by a separate route that has been a separate recommendation to policy and resources committee back in October. Um, so that, that that's being covered by a separate route. The report tonight notes that this won't be a one and done conversation. We do continually review the scheme of delegation and the procedure rules um, to, see, or to ensure that they are still optimum. So we may well come back to the group in due course um, with further suggestions. The proposal, please, is that we recommend the proposed changes um, to go forward to the Constitution Working Group um, and then onwards from there. So Appendix Three, if I can focus member attention there, that is the version that we propose goes forward. Very colourful. Red is the changes that were brought to you in September. Grey is the changes that have emerged since that discussion at PTP in September. 
and um, I hope that was clear. Like I said, I do appreciate it's got quite confusing to follow the chain of, of suggestions, but very happy to take any questions and thank you. Sure. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, comes to speed. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, thank you to the uh, officer for um, taking on board some of the comments we made at the last meeting and incorporating um, some of those into the revised draft. Um, the first thing to say is that I, I agree in principle with the thinking behind this because I think that too many very small scale applications are brought to committee that really don't need to be. Um, a couple of meetings ago, we spent 45 minutes debating the relative merits of a replacement fence. And even after 45 minutes, uh, resolved to defer it. Um, so issues like that really shouldn't be taking up the committee's time. And um, we need to have more time to devote to the more serious planning applications. Um, and certainly there are quite a few coming up at the moment. Um, but I, I do feel that this this latest draft still goes a little bit too far the other way. Um, if we look at clause 2815.2, in the previous draft, um, it was actually proposed that all household applications would be um, decided under delegated powers and would not go to committee under any circumstances. This has been um, marginally um, watered down, um, but only to the extent that um, as covered by section D. Now section D refers to applications which the head of planning considers to be in the public interest, principally those that would meet the standard triggers for EIE, EIA uh, submission. So that would be the only criterion for um, household applications to be referred to the committee. I, I think that's too prescriptive. I think borough councillors should have the power to have an application considered by the committee. There are sometimes very good reasons um, for that. Um, looking at 2815.2 subsection B, um, this is basically where um, borough councillors or parish councillors, parish councils can call in an application provided that any such representations are in the professional opinion of the head of planning based upon relevant considerations. Now, this means the head of planning basically has the final decision and can overrule a parish council or a borough councillor, and I don't think that's right. Um, I think relevant considerations is is too vague. What does relevant mean? Um, it basically seems to be the head of planning's opinion, and I think that's that's too subjective. And I know one of the concerns has been that um, parish councils have been calling in applications not for sound planning reasons, but actually I think parish councils are getting much more clued up on what material considerations are. They've had a lot of training. There was a swell area committee um, training session the other week, which was um, very good. And I think parish councils are much better briefed on what a material consideration is and therefore why uh, a referral to the committee is justified. And I, I think if a, a parish council does want an application to be referred to the committee, I think they should be allowed to. And I don't believe that the head of planning should be able to overrule that. Um, I would say, however, that um, this just refers to encouraging the parish council to send a representative. If, frankly, if the parish council fails to send a representative to the planning committee, having called it in, I think that um, the matter should be taken off the agenda and referred back to the officers for a delegated decision. Because if they can't be bothered to turn up, then they don't deserve to to put their case. Um, there are, I'm pleased to see that um, parish councils can speak at the meeting after a site visit, which previously they weren't able to do. So that's a welcome change. Um, I agree with all votes being recorded votes because I think we need to be accountable to our residents. Um, and I'm also very pleased to see the removal of the requirements to write to the head of planning if we vote against the officer's recommendation. Thank you. I don't know if 
you want officers to come back first, or just want me to add more stuff? Or okay, it'd probably it's easier if we do that. Do, do, yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to go along, but thank you. I think the only part of that that I would like to come back on is where we speak about the opinion of the head of planning. We we did discuss that last time, and I've I have put in the word professional opinion just to be clear that this is based on technical guidance, not not on a on a whim. Um, and that would be the professional opinion of the head of planning in consultation with case officers. So it would it would very likely be a collective decision. So there, it, it's not it's not an opportunity for a maverick decision to be made. It, it it's a professional opinion of people who work to a code of conduct to the RTPI. So that that was put in to try to give members some comfort around that not just being a a lone voice. Thank you. Councillor Speed, you want to come up? Thank you. If I could just come briefly on that. Um, I wasn't suggesting it would be a magnetic decision, but I, I fundamentally disagree that officers have the right to overrule decisions by members. We are a member-led administration, not an officer-led administration. And if a borough councillor wants a case to be called into the planning committee, I think they should have the right to do so. Councillor see that. I mean, in fact, this is this is actually the change in this section is is um, from the point of view of members, um, because the looking back at the um, original consultate uh, constitution, um, the um, head of planning always had the right to um, consider whether it was a re relevant planning commit uh, consideration for parish councils and um, statutory consultees. It's the members that, in fact, that are excluded here. So I think that's something that possibly we need to, to, you know, ha have a view on as as a as a committee. At this point, this. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think the one of the considerations is whether members might actually be doing something vexatiously with this. I suppose. That, I'm not sure whether that's something that could be brought to a standards committee if if, if a, a procedure was being used in a vexatious manner. Is is that something that would um, so I could ask sort of democratic services on on that view if it, if it was felt that a procedure is being used in a vexatious manner to bringing applications willy nilly to to committee whether that's something that that would trigger standards. I, th I think that's some of the thinking. Um, Councillor Bonney. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I note the comment about um, householder applications. I mean, I think there are instances, and we might talk about fence one in particular, because it's outside of a householder, but actually they have a significant impact either on pedestrian, highway safety, um, et cetera, and landscapes, um, an important impact on on landscapes so we talk about there about householder applications with the exceptions what about small commercial applications because sometimes it is some of these um they're not necessarily big applications but the most controversial elements it's around design quite often um so if i just could have some clarification around that Thank you. Yes, so actually picking up on an earlier point from Councillor Speed, we have said that applications which principally but not exclusively those which would meet the standard triggers for environmental impact assessments. So we have added in that safeguard that members wanted to see around household applications being able to come um, still because they were precluded under the September version. Um, that exclusion didn't capture small commercial or anything else other than saying householders were the thing that we would exclude from coming forward. So small commercial would still be under the same provisions as we have currently. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't put my mic on. So that it could still be called in if it's a small commercial one. Yeah, yeah. they're not exclusive. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Hunt. Thanks. Um, mine, mine was on the, the point of um, the opinion of the head of planning based on relevant planning considerations because i i understand what councillor speed is saying with that um and having officers just 
overall in councillors but we also do see too many applications coming forward where councillors have just said I want to call this in don't not give it any reason and sometimes even not turning up to the committee and explaining it so I think something does have to go in there but I, I wonder whether just to be absolutely clearer that we should be putting the representations are based on national and local policy we actually got policy on there and then it's goes to the head of planning to to agree or whoever's going to be agreeing that. But if these points have to be put that there is policy reasons for the calling, then they they have to then be given and then agreed by officers that that is a relevant planning consideration. So it's, it's putting the onus back on members um, or, or consultees uh, sorry, on, or the parish council, um, but they do have to actually come up with relevant planning policy. And the other just question that I had from going through was on the committee procedurals. Uh, members will need to be clear what constitutes lobbying. Um, just will, will the protocol be done for the, the member developer protocol be done prior to these changes coming in? Because we need that list first before this is actually comes into force. No, we will absolutely make sure it is. This report still has to go through the Constitution Working Group and then full council, so there is still a way to go for this report, and we'll make sure that document is available before anything is brought in. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Tassan, just to clarify on on, on the the point you're making about um, national and local policy, I think that would be applying to members of the borough council being able to call in and have to having to so so really, in a sense, putting them in in the same constrictions as, as the as the parish councils yeah it would be because yeah so sorry at the moment it's a statutory consultee and parish town councillor isn't it so um I, I think it is right we were talking about members calling it in that it also does apply and i think i did say that last time as well but everyone might not agree but um I, I just do think that whatever is done has to be whether it's statutory consultee member or parish and town council should be based on relevant policy and not just uh, calling it in. So in sense you're agreeing with it as, as it stands and uh, amended at the moment? I'm agreeing with it as it stands, but with policy, make, just making it clearer that it's policy rather than just saying it's relevant considerations, um, just, just making planning. it policy mm -hmm. compliant compliant um, and then it's just easier that because there could be arguments what are relevant planning considerations um, if it is actually said that it's policy considerations then it's in I'd say it's black and white you've got national policy you've got our own policy if it's in there it's clear if it's not then you're not going to have arguments about what it is and what it isn't. That's right. Yes thanks Chair. I, I, I just agree with what Councillor Hunt has just said um, because as things stand at the moment, the word planning is actually deleted from the from the draft. Um, so that waters it down even more. It just becomes relevant considerations, which seems to me far too wishy-washy. But the relevant policy, national or local considerations, I do think would tighten it up. And they would apply to all three categories as set out. I think we need the numbers again, if it's impossible, Chairman. One, two and three, rather than five, six and three, for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, if we can, I, I would, if that's a, a proposal from Councillor Hunter to, to change that wording, then I'd say I'd happily second it. I can't note that. Um, can I come back with that? Because I, I must be, I was looking at the wrong page because where all the different things are. So yeah, that's where, where it is clearly stated that the parish and town council want the applications reported to the planning committee. And then it goes down, doesn't it, where the head of planning determines a representation from three above is not based on relevant considerations. They're right to the town parish. So, so that part is just that. Sorry, I'm just reading through again now. The part where policy needs to be put in there is that. provided that some representation are in the professional opinion of head of planning so that would be changed to 
based on relevant policy based on relevant, relevant local, local and national, national policy. policy i'm just trying to work out how how it would word it but officers probably you need to get it the right way around and then opinion of the head of planning i think joanne knows what i'm talking about it's just um, <laughs> it's just which way around it goes when we're in the right place that's funny yeah i think we're unduly tying yourself in knots over there because quite honestly if a member wants to call it in and the easiest, simplest way is just on design, you know, applies to pretty much everything. There'll be about three or four reasons or excuses, whatever you want to call them, material considerations um, that could be wheeled out for any application. And I think you're tying yourselves in knots, quite frankly. And I think members, especially if that member is a, a member of the planning committee, shouldn't be putting a reason in there in case they are overreaching um, or could be seen to be have some bias beforehand. Um, so I'd just leave that as drafted. Thank you. Are there any other comments at all? I, I, I've just got one in, in that the, um, I think we need a little bit of more clarity about the uh, householder applications. Um, at the moment, it would appear to exclude um members or officers who are also putting in a householder application i'd always understood that the intention was that those should come to, to committee um so perhaps we need some some clarity ar around that um just going back to the the proposal about the um the uh, council hunter proposal are members ha happy to put that in about the what what should be considered by the head of planning um, if we could have a show of hands if they're in support of that one. OK, so we'll, we'll put that in about that, but we'll leave it otherwise as it is. Yeah, and, and I agree that the lobbying definition definitely does need to be um, sorted as, as soon as we can. The only other one that I'm picked up was about the um, change between notifying and consulting on enforcement decisions. Um, is there much difference there um, or, and and or is that something that's going to be addressed elsewhere? Uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, so this was a change that was suggested initially. So the current constitution says we will take enforcement action once we have consulted with the chair or vice chair and the local ward members. Um, we propose changing that to notifying because it's a very formulaic, rigid process that we go through. We don't want to give the perception that members can influence that. So that was designed to give a level of protection for members as well as, as part of that process. That's the rationale for that change coming forward. Thank you. Sorry, on on the on the um, enforcement. Um, did we square that circle around um, once um, once an officer's decided whether enforcement action is going to take take place? The feedback into the board member, whether it is or it isn't. I, I think at the moment we're not always notified that. It, you know, that decision's been made that it would or wouldn't happen. Thank you. Um, so this is a point that we have come to realise as part of the enforcement local plan work. So subsequent to looking at these these raft of schema delegation proposed changes, we, I think it's something that we would bring forward to a future meeting, but perhaps we can just be cheeky and slip it in here tonight. The current constitution says we will... Oh, Constitution says we will consult with members. We are proposing we will notify them if we are going to take enforcement action. That's anomalous in that if we're not going to take enforcement action, it's equally as important for members to be aware of that. So we think that should come forward as a future change. I don't know if members are happy that we just discussed that tonight and I'll work that into the version that goes to Constitution. Yeah, through. I'm happy with that. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so with the um, 
do you feel that we've um, mentioned? Are we happy for this to go forward to the Constitution Working Group? Yes. All those in favour? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we need we need a proposer and a seconder for that. I'll propose. <laughs> what was a bun fight there? <laughs> House House Weekly seconds. Okay, all those in favour? All those against? And any abstentions? Uh, so that's carried that it will go forward. Right, so going back up the agenda to the uh, conservation areas review, um, Jibil could ask you to in introduce those. The, well, starting with Marine Town. Hello. Yeah. It's working. So, um, Sheerness Marine Town Conservation Area. It was designated in 1976, and no appraisal had been done for it. So, it's the first time that the area has been appraised, and it's the first time since 1976 that boundaries have been reviewed of the conservation area. Um, it is on Historic England's Heritage at Risk Register as well. Um, the area has deteriorated quite a lot since 1976, of course. Um, so we had a public consultation from 10th of August to 21st of September this year for six weeks. and. Uh, we, on Historic England's request, we even extended the consultation period by 10 days. And in spite of that, we had very, very poor response from local residents and within the borough. Um, so for Marine Town, we received three responses from local residents and one response from Neptune Residents Association. Um, the whole conservation area is very residential oriented, so the, the document works around that aspect. Um, there are two areas proposed to be extended, uh, boundary extension, which is on page 57 of your reports. Um, area A uh, is towards the west of Marie current Marine Town Conservation Area, and that includes three listed buildings within the vicinity. One is uh, Neptune Terrace, uh, there's a church, and there's a, there are remains of a windmill. And around that area are some terraces which date back to 1800s, and they still have certain element of um, architectural uh, elements, surviving architectural elements, which are in decent condition. Um, so it was felt that it would be useful to include those areas in the conservation area to give it more gravitas and to be able to protect the area in a much better manner, more holistic manner. Um, and the second extension is proposed along the <clears throat> southeast of the current conservation area. This is primarily to include um, the 1976 boundary had divided Alma Street into half, and it was felt that I think that that whole street should be included um, just to give it a, a proper conclusion. So these are the two extensions proposed. Um, there is currently Article 4 direction within the uh, conservation area, and that is proposed to be extended to the newer properties that have been included along the west of the conservation area. So um, recommendation is to uh, agree to redesignate and agree to boundary extensions. And there's a there's a management plan included, which primarily talks about how we can better manage these properties within the conservation area. Thank you, Jamil. Are there any uh, questions concerning this? Councillor Whiting. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that um, run through. Um, 
I, I agree with this. I, I, I suppose my only question is why are we limiting some of the extensions when we're limiting them? Take your point about Alma Street, but actually on some of the older maps. Here on Alma Road, for example, is a much longer street when you, you know, a century ago uh, when we were including again in the extensions that we're proposing. I just wondered why the I can understand why perhaps down the street, because you've got the, the road that, that bisects it with the other extension to it. And the Alma Road, there's other other areas and other streets within there that have the same characteristics, it seems to me, um, as those that we're including in the proposed extensions. Um, Marine Town is is actually quite interesting. Your your question's very good question because this was something I grappled with quite a lot because um, I mean I personally like underdogs of heritage so when you walk around marine town it's just amazing it's the way it has survived those street the straight down street patterns and the views it's just absolutely amazing we can't um, but we have to have uh, a proper justification for designating such vast area and uh, by completing the extension uh, which is identified as boundary B extension that is basically a snapshot of how the rest of the conservation area is or how rest of marine town is towards the south and conservation area primarily picks on, um, like for example, on Alma Road, there's one half of Alma Road which is included because um, it, it, that particular terrace still has surviving features, whereas the rest, rest of the terrace has lost its features. So we would struggle to justify to include it in the conservation area. But you, made a, you make a very, very valid point, and that has been acknowledged within the document as key views and it has been acknowledged that this street pattern and um, there hasn't been a, a lot of change to the houses in terms of scale. Yes, the windows and doors have changed or the elements have been lost, but the scale is the same. And that uh, that's almost like. Uh, um, so that has been acknowledged in the document as key views and character of not just the conservation area, but the area south of the conservation area. Thank you. Savani. Thank you. And along similar lines, I mean, I, th I think the architecture is quite amazing. And um, I think there is so many gems in and around Sheerness that, you know, um, with some TLC could really, you know, um, be quite amazing. I, I'm just looking at the extension and then looking at um, the next one we're going to talk about. And we're literally about half a street away aren't we and there's nothing we can do to join them up or does it make not make sense to join them up are you saying that that half a street is just there's just not the significant heritage there that we could pin down <laughs> that was another discussion we had quite a lot but um the that particular block has really lost its uh, historic significance so to speak and uh, the priorities for both the conservation areas are very different. One is very residential oriented and one is very commercial and high street oriented. If we, we don't gain by just crossing and, and combining them, I think efforts should be um, targeted for both conservation areas for what their needs are. Yes, land. This, I, I'm looking at as an example, Alma Street and that, that extension there. Whilst at the moment those properties are might not be as as say as good as the other part, but in in historic interest, I, I guess. Um, in the future, they may do because people may buy them, and I don't know, if the house has been pebble dashed or something, they may say, oh, "Actually, we don't like this. We're going to start getting it back to." Is there anything that we can do? If you, we don't want to put things in there that make people to go and buy a house, and they have to do it, is there anything we can do to encourage people that if any application things do come up in those areas, 
we've got something in here to recognise that those areas to the to the south and southeast have got an interest, and that if anyone does come forward of anything, we would sort of want to look at them and encourage people to to bring them up to a better standard. Um, well, we wouldn't identify them as development opportunities because we theoretically we want to maintain the scale and the 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 scale that the houses have with the street and and the vistas and uh, the views along there. Um, but you are right there there is potential for improvement to existing housing stock and that has been acknowledged in the management plan and there there um i've, I've also provided um, an exemplary of victorian terrace and what can be done um so i think that would be the starting point Yep, certainly. Would, would it is it possible uh, to, to to look at those areas that we think have got an interest in there that could be improved? And obviously, it's not a boundary to to show that it's the conservation area, but almost drawing a boundary to to say what area we are looking at that could have the potential improvements. So, if if anyone did come forward and want to do something, they, it's clear which areas are being looked at, and especially if there's a planning application. Um, for us in the future as well, we we know and the applicants know what area is looking at. So it's al almost a, a boundary of interest, I, I guess, that's actually drawn out and marked where it, where it's shown a bit more, if it's possible. Um, I suppose we could do that as an additional exercise too, because there are lots of aspects within the management plan which do require implementation and I'll make a note of it and that that could be included in when the implementation part can be started. Thank you. I think to partially answer that, I think probably what Sheerness needs is a policy um, in the local plan around uh, the town centre um, like we've done for Sittingbourne, where we've you know reviewed the conservation area and then we've gone that step further and created a document for what our aspirations are for certain areas and it would be encapsulating exactly what you say it goes beyond the conservation area um, and I suspect it's something that really is quite needed for Sheerness to give give people a, a sort of an idea of what the future for Sheerness could be I mean I, I think it's got outstanding architecture it is a you know, it's a rough diamond, isn't it, really? But um, it'd be nice for it to move on um, in that respect. Thank you. So are there any further comments? So are we, um, we need a proposer and a seconder, a seconder for the recommendations? So just to chip in there, maybe then what our recommendation is that we adopt this, but overarching is that the the, the group feels that a policy for the town centre of Sheerness should be brought forward under the next local plan as a piece of work. Yeah, so that will we'll amend the proposal to, to that thing, to that effect. Um, all those in favour? And uh, that was everyone, I think. So that's unanimous. That's so. Now we move on to uh, Mile Town. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Mile Town Conservation Area covers the High Street and Broadway, and um, this was also designated in 1976. And an appraisal was a brief appraisal was done for it in 2000. Um, and since then, this is the first time. So after 23 years, we've now appraised it fully and reviewed the boundary and um, 
uh, it was consulted along with Marine Town. So consultation went on from 10th August to 21st of September and then was extended till about 6th of October, if I remember correctly. Um, again, the response was very poor. Um, we had two local residents and one from Historic England, which was a rather detailed response from Historic England. Um, this conservation area is also on Heritage at Risk Register, and uh, the uh, it it does have a a lot of a lot of connected, lot more connected history with the Blue Town. Um, so on page 132 of your documents are the two areas uh, that are proposed to be extended within the conservation area for, for, for Mile Town Conservation Area. Um, area A is uh, to include parts of Rose Street and uh, there's a listed building there and there are um, some remnants of industrial architecture along that street and it, it was felt necessary to include that. And then area B, uh, basically, it includes rest of the high street up until A205. I think it's A205. A. And although that part of the high street is not, um, not of high historic significance compared to rest of the high street, which was already part of the conservation area, but Historic England felt that we should extend it up till there so that the management plan, once implemented, can improve the whole high street, the entire high street as a whole, and not just stop where the conservation area currently stops. Um, so these are the two areas, and uh, the management plan for this conservation area focuses on uh, shop fronts. Um, it also proposes area of special advertisement control, if we can, because um, planning applications that usually come up for the shop, especially along Broadway, um, it's, it's quite a long battle for every tiny shop to try and maintain what whatever little elements are left, and, and especially signages and uh, features of existing shop fronts. So that would be a, a positive for the conservation area if that can be implemented moving forward. So proposal is to redesignate the conservation area and to agree to the boundary extensions. Thank you. That's funny. Thank you. And to the officer to say, you know, for all three of these, there's a huge amount of work and I'd like to say thank you very much. You know, it's it's brilliant. It's um, especially after such a long period of time. This is desperately needed um, to be done. This piece of work, a couple of little tiny bugbears and they are little um, in the character appraisal um, on page 15 and we've got the red white and blue of the clock tower can we get an up-to-date one with our nice green one that we've so lovingly restored as a council because it does look magnificent now and it goes back to its original I think what is great on page 16 is showing the clock over the years and then look, we've put our carriage lamps back on and the colour schemes being restored. Um, but we've also done some works around um, the actual uh, centre there with the benches and, uh, you know, the um, planters. So if we could get an up to date photo, um, because this will be used in future um, by lots of people. And I think it's a nice record to show the current state of it in a nice, glorious photo there. Um, I do agree with the boundary extensions there. I think that's exactly the area that needs to be covered and to make sure the relevant conservation area materials are used when work's then undertaken on there's some quite significant buildings there. So I'd um, just like to uh, endorse what's been done. 
and if we can show off what we've done as well to its best, I'd be delighted. Thank you. Any further comments? Um, in the case we need, we need a proposer and a, and a seconder. Councillor so Carnell got in first for proposing and uh, second. Right, Th those in favour that uh, this goes to uh, policy and resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamil. And yeah, echo uh, Councillor Bonnie's comments about the, the work that's gone into this. It's uh, truly impressive. Thank you. <clears throat> right, so if we're now moving on to item eight, the Enhanced Partnership um, Local Focus Group. Uh, John, could you perhaps int introduce this? Uh... Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, I'll keep this relatively short. So members will remember back in September, the working group discussed whether we should set up a local focus group and we made some recommendations around who should sit on that group. So at the 18th, on the 18th of October, Policy and Resources Committee considered our recommendations from this group um, regarding the establishment of the local focus group, which was agreed. That was very much supportive. Um, they changed our recommendation slightly. So we had initially suggested that this group should be represented by the chair and the vice chair. Policy and Resources said that should be any two members of this group. So it's back to us today um, to make a re recommendation again to Policy and Resources as to who those two representatives from this group should be. Thank you. So do I have some, uh, any uh, nominations? Chair, I'd like to propose uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you. So, of our first uh, nomination, are there any other nominations? I, I, I'm I'm happy to be proposed if someone wants to propose me. <laughs> right. So we have we have two nominations, including a professional victim. <laughs> Right, so um, we just need to vote. All, the, all those in, in favour? OK, that's unanimous. Thank you. And I think that concludes the, uh, the meeting for, for, for tonight. Thank you.